Um, I'm going to ask my uh, co-chair, Ed Dumble, who's the guy that um, most of you know is putting on a significant part of the, the really technical content at the conference. Uh, Ed and I have been working on Strata uh, for uh, over a year now, and um, we've been thrilled to see the Strata topic grow into something um, pretty interesting, pretty, pretty big with lots of people behind it, um, and also to see how the field has matured from how the field has matured from very dry um, topics to uh, really societal impacts and, and broader, more interesting things like uh, the psychology of perception. And uh, we're thrilled uh, about the lineup we've got coming up in um, Strata at the end of the, at the end of February. Um, Ed, what are you excited about in the show this year? Hi, Asta. Thanks, and good morning, everybody. I think one of the most exciting things for me is just seeing how this area is growing up and subdividing into disciplines. Um, you know, over the last year, we, we felt very much that it in last year was this coming out party for data scientists, that the excitement um, at the conference was, was palpable of, of a lot of people discovering that they came from very different industries and, um, you know, different job titles, but they were all doing something that that was the same as each other, uh, and this thing we sort of called data science, this entrepreneurial, investigative, um, business savvy, but very uh, technical, hacky way to getting value from, from data. Um, and that, I think we've seen really uh, take rocket off over the last year. You know, so now we have stories in CNN and, and Fortune and whatever about how data science is the great new gig, and we have our rock stars like DJ Patil getting, um, you know, Fancy Pants magazine covers and whatnot. Um, and at the same time as we've seen that of the last year, I think the other sort of exciting thing is that on the implementation side of things, there are now a lot more mature options for companies who really want to get into data science and, and big data without having to find their own rock star. So we're still early days, but I think one of the things I'm excited about is this kind of step on in maturity, and that's something that we'll see in the in the program. There's a lot more experience out there, a lot more people to hear from and build your own efforts on top of. Yeah, they're really, I mean, I, I really have seen a lot of mainstreaming of the big data concept. There was an NPR radio article a few weeks ago, and I thought, okay, you know, now at that point it sort of hit, hit the mainstream when some wired and, and NPR. And I think, uh, you know, what's interesting also, Ed, is, is the way that the word big has shifted, right? Um, big traditionally meant so much data, it's stored on petabytes of storage arrays. What about the shift towards things like, you know, fast data uh, or simply bigger than I can process myself data? There seems to be other elements of big, shared, fast, and so on, that, that are sort of broadening the description of the field. Yeah, I think we've, we've come to see this sort of definition of, of big data as being you know, being in one of three primary axes, either volume, you know, size, as you talked about, velocity, speed, or or variety, and all of those matter. I think the one, the the aspects that people will get to grips with first, uh, and where you know a lot of value in is available, is still in in the size. You know, this is why Hadoop is so important because it offers a cheap way to get a handle on the really large data, um, but it also uh, because it doesn't require any sort of pre-defined cleaning or definition of schemas like data warehousing does, allows people to get on top of the variety and integrate, integrate data of, of various sorts. You mentioned velocity, and that's really important. And I think dealing with streaming data coming in is going to be one of the um, points we'll see developing over the next few years. If you take like the last four years of Hadoop development as people get into grips with the, the variety and the size, I think we're going to see the same kind of um, thing over the next uh, three or four years with fast data. And the reason for this is, as you say, uh, and pointed out yourself, everybody is a sensor now. Every, your web interactions are generating a stream of data. Your mobile phone is generating a stream of data. And all of this stuff just can't be stored. You need to process it as it comes in. One of the most interesting facts uh, that points towards this I, I heard, uh, I, I believe it, um, and if not, it's still a great story. I was talking to Jason Hoffman of, of Joyent. He kind of made this point about storage in the world. 
that uh, if you take the telemetry from all of the BMW 3 Series, you know, these things are massively instrumented, 100 plus sensors on each of these cars. You take this te telemetry, there isn't enough storage in the world, in hard disk, you know, in the current commercial storage market to actually store everything that would stream off just all the BMW 3 Series. So the point is that we need to develop more ways to process things um, as they come in, selectively throw away, and engage in real-time reaction to big data. Yeah, I heard the same number about uh, the amount of in, uh, data that comes off an engine off a 747 crossing the Atlantic. I think, you know, wasn't it the guy from last year that said um, at CERN the thing that worries him most is the 99.99% of data they throw away at the sensor? Right, and that's really concerning. Um, I think that could be a very interesting, you know, skill of the data scientist going forward. We've talked about their sort of entrepreneurial ability to, you know, ferret out and experiment with patterns in the data. And this kind of human, intuitive, investigative attitude is going to be needed to make crucial decisions about which data to keep, which data to throw away. And there's something yeah, I want to ask. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I say there's something I actually wanted to ask ask you is to take the conversation also a bit more towards um, kind of the consequences of, of, of data. Uh, one of the interesting things that uh, came up in Strata in last November, we were just talking with Mark Goodman about data and, um, you know, computer crimes. Uh, it's, we talked about the volume of stuff as, as data going through. But on a very small scale, and this obviously ties in with what Dan said, data is very sensitive on a case-by-case -case level. Mark Goodman last year absolutely astonished us with, you know, this criminal black market in data. And that was very simple data, sort of credit card data and so on. But he also said something really interesting about how easy it was, crime was becoming, because of our sort of networked creative industry, that people now could use a 3D printer to manufacture a credit card skimmer to put on an ATM, and these patterns were going about. And I know we've, we, we're starting to look at and start to think about the interaction of this kind of commodity hardware on, with ready availability of data. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the Pirate Bay uh, a couple of days ago announced that they were going to have a, um, a website for, I think I had a screenshot of it. Um, I guess I'll open that by saying that, um, you know, Mark Andreessen uh, had this great presentation about software is eating the world, um, by which he meant that every single thing is being replaced by software. And, and I think that's a pretty interesting take on things. Um, he meant it somewhat metaphorically, but I think that it's actually uh, prescient in another sense. Um, every supply chain you see today, uh, if you're a car manufacturer, you have to keep spare parts lying around for a certain number of years. Um, and that takes inventory and warehousing and fixed goods and so on. And then along comes the world of 3D printing, and, and we may be at, I, I built a, a MakerBot over Christmas. You know, we're still at the homebrew computer club kind of stage there, but within a few years, you're going to see startups, uh, many of which are still in stealth, producing printers, and, and much like the HP model, making money off the ink. Um, I could easily see a world where uh, the FedEx truck isn't delivering the goods to me, the FedEx truck is delivering the raw materials to me, the plastic to be extruded, the lathe pieces, the Arduino that the code goes into, and so on. And then I'm assembling things at the edge, right? And that changes the nature of the supply chain dramatically. Um, you know, nothing drove this home as much as the Pirate Bay, and this is the screen I went on there, and now, of course, I'm under surveillance by all kinds of authorities, but um, this is the Pirate's Bay, Pirate Bay's new uh, 3D printer, uh, 3D object model uh, download, where uh, there's going to be, if, if you thought the copyright war over music was a big deal, just wait until it becomes a copyright war over physical assets. Um, when you can download a model, print it, it's close to the original, close enough. Uh, download some code from someone, put it on your Arduino, snip it in there with a couple of motors, and you've built yourself a, a physical good. And so um, when data replaces the world's supply chains, we're going to see disintermediation of tons of other things the way that we've seen it for the music industry or the publishing industry. To me, that's fascinating because, uh, and I think you said it best yesterday, that data is the seed of stuff. Um, when we get to a world where everything is data-driven, um, and, and so much of our lives are actually data that's manifested at the edge like that. Um, that's, a, that's a very different society from the one we know today. 
Absolutely. I, I'm utterly confident that it's one we have a, a, no real idea how to deal with. When you sort of look at how, how difficult it is for legislators even to um, you know, revise things like copyright and their, um, an intellectual property just in, in a digital world, when the, that kind of network effect starts spilling out uh, into sort of ubiquitous manufacturing. I really have no idea <laughs> where we're going to go. Yeah. But I think you know, that's one of the useful things about uh, what we're doing at Strata is that if anyone's going to be able to start to understand and, and figure this stuff out, we need to come together to understand the consequences of what we're doing. Um, and I think that, that, that leads us into, to take that from the sort of, you know, we're talking about a large grand idea scale, but take that down into um, a more personal level, you know, at your, at your job or in your life. We often talk about the last mile, um, this problem that we have a large amount of spewing data, even larger amounts now, but the big issue is that we can do all the computation we want, but at the end of the day, we as people have to make sense of it. And it feels like our ability to do that is very much still in its infancy. So, um, speaking of infancy, you know, I was trying to get abreast of all the different technologies that are out there and, and the stack, because what seemed only a few months ago, like this pretty esoteric big data, sort of go get yourself a bunch of machines, install Hadoop and hire a PhD, is quickly becoming, just make an SQL query. Like, you know, we're, we're starting to, uh, the, the, the systems are starting to meet traditional enterprise interfaces more than halfway. Um, do you think that's how enterprises are going to adopt this stuff? Is, is that how we're going to adopt it, that, that big data will just look like what we've always done, but there'll be powerful things behind the curtain? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, that's exactly what's, what's going on in it. And uh, if you look roughly over all the big, the big data solutions, um, you know, the, the MPP, uh, the massive parallel processing databases that were made headway before Hadoop became so popular, such as, as Vertica, which uh, famously Zynga use, they offer um, basically extensions to SQL or a version of SQL that really looks very familiar to people running on databases. Look at, um, as well, Hive, the data warehousing project that sits on top of Hadoop, um, again offers a SQL-like uh, interface. And the power of that is that people can provide a JDBC or an ODBC adapter, so it plugs into your regular Java programs that uh, access relational data, or it plugs into uh, you know, Excel or, or whatnot. I think SQL is definitely the point of enterprise sort of interoperability. Uh, and one of the most things that might be more interesting to people is to know that even Google think that, right? So if you look at their big data offering, this big query thing that uh, is in private beta now and is, is going to be made public later in the year, this is a, a massive uh, sort of terabyte store for analyzing such large volumes of data. And, and the interface they've chosen there is SQL. So I think even over the, the, uh, the databases, Cassandra and whatnot, that are you know, more column oriented and what and so on, we'll see over the next year or two a lot of those implementation details go away as more friendly interfaces come on, come on top of it. Um, so did now, you just say the future of NoSQL was SQL? <laughs> yeah, it, it really kind of is um, <laughs> because that's, that's how people understand how to, how to program it. We should yeah. draw a distinction, though, Alistair, I think, between, uh, you know, big data used for analytics and investigation versus sort of big data used in production as part of a feedback loop of a larger system. The SQL thing, I think, is most critical at that analytical layer. Um, what you do with big data when it's part of a big production system, I don't think that SQL is as important a factor there. Um, what you're really after there is speed. Yeah, it's a lot like the difference between prototyping where you can take the time to, you know, build a model and put on a lathe or carve a car by hand versus production where you have to set up an assembly line and put the wheels on in a certain order and so on. And you really have the first stage, which is the exploratory sort of validation stage where it's how efficiently can I make prototypes and iterate versus, um, you know, what, what can I do to give me the greatest, greatest correctness and predictability and, and resiliency in my manufacturing supply chain. That's right, and it, one of the, the good things about this area is that regardless of whether it's big or not, 
people are understanding that getting facility for, da for your data, being able to um, be agile with, with your data in the same way that over the last 10 years, you know, the agile movement has swept over software development, people understand, are beginning to understand now that that's very important in your analytical environment. It's, it's even a marketing tag that Greenplum, for instance, actually use. But what this does is it leaves a wide open space for, for, new, for new entrants who don't have the baggage of all the data warehousing era, who maybe are, you know, have come from a web era mentality of, of solving those kinds of problems. So I'm pretty gratified that there are a lot of new startups and a lot of new um, entrants into this technology arena. All right, uh, a couple of quick shout-outs for stuff that you've written recently, Ed. Um, I know you're not going to promote them, so I will. Uh, for those of you on the call and want to come up to speed on this quickly, uh, Ed wrote a thing called Five Big Data Predictions for 2012 that's on radar right now. Um, really great way of understanding some of the stuff that we've just been talking about. And um, there's an amazing article there called What is Big Data, which if you really want to um, understand this whole change um, and kind of name and claim the space, I would go have a... Have a uh, uh, read of this. It's a great piece that's over on O'Reilly Radar now. Uh, thank you, Ed. Looking forward to hanging out on the West Coast in a few weeks and uh, really excited to see the content coming together as it is.